Hi, friends. Thanks for joining us. It's been a while. We took a bye with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, but we're excited to be back. Don't forget to do us a huge favor. Smash the subscribe button if you're on YouTube. It really helps the channel grow. Benny, where can they find us on social media? Yeah, you can find us at Ray Benny Sports. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Also check us out on Reddit and Discord. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite podcast provider. And just because if you didn't hear me because I forgot to put my mic up front again, <laughs> smash that subscribe button on YouTube. We've had so many subscribers lately. It really helps the channel grow. We're super excited, especially coming into the end of CFL season, going into the playoffs. Super crazy time for CFL, so thank you very much. But let's get right into it. Bomber Talk brought to you by Fahrenheit Airbrushing. Stand out on the ice, pavement, or on the field or in the stands with a custom airbrushed helmet, goalie mask, or any project. A local Manitoba business with affordable solutions for any project. Check out Fahrenheit Airbrushing on Facebook or call them at 204-891-7431. And don't forget to tell them that Ray and Benny sent you. Let's get right into the business. Bombers play the Elks. Both teams are on a roll right now. Bombers cementing themselves kind of-ish at first place for now. What do the Bombers have to do to beat the Elks? Uh, let's start on offense. You can go first. Yeah, coming into this game, this game, this one's in Edmonton. So Edmonton currently sits two and four at home. Winnipeg's two and four on the road. So, uh, and Edmonton's won five of six. Bombers are on their own winning streak as well. So offensively, the Elks give up a lot of yards. Just looking at their stats from the last few games, a lot of yards through the air, pat, uh, and rushing as well. But they don't give up a lot of points. Uh, in the six games, of five out of six, they've averaged only given up twenty one point six points in that range. And if you take that first game that they won against Saskatchewan, they've only given up 19 on average. So it's going to be a tough slog for the Bombers, who have already struggled to score uh, touchdowns so far this season. So I'm, I'm expecting to see a low-scoring game because both of these defenses are kind of the ones that give up a lot of yards, um, but not a lot of points. Edmonton in the last four games, and I know a lot of it was against Calgary, but 12 turnovers against Calgary alone uh, in those two games four against Hamilton, two against BC. So they're turning up, they're causing a lot of turnovers, uh, which is helping their offense quite a bit. So the Bombers are going to have to be wary of that. And Zach Claros is going to have to protect that ball. Um, and also that, you know, the D-line for Edmonton has been pretty good. So they're going to get at him and cause some pressure. So Zach Claros is going to have to protect that ball, make some smart decisions. And I think they're going to have to kind of rely maybe on Oliveira because there's going to be some yards to be gained here against the Elks uh, and use Oliveira on the ground and uh, pound that Edmonton D. The Bombers have to establish the run, and they have to dominate time of possession and keep Edmonton's offense off the field. With that said, Edmonton allows QBs to be very efficient, so I'd really like to see Brady Oliver being used in the passing game. Let's stretch out their linebackers, have their DBs looking into the backfield, looking into the flats for Oliver, and maybe trying to jump that, get a tackle, and then that will leave someone open later on. But I think everything, like you said, has to go through Oliver. Uh, they have to dominate the line of scrimmage, get that running game going, and use him in the passing game. Like I said before, get this guy 20 touches. If it's 10 carries and 10 receptions, that's fine. 15 and 5, whatever. 19 and one, but get Brady Olavera involved and maybe get him a touchdown. The O line <laughs> has to shut down Noah Curtis yeah. and Elliot Brown. Those are two very dangerous ends. And it's not like they can double team them on every play because you got to worry about Sean Oakman in the middle who causes ca uh, chaos. Like the O line will be tested and the success as cliche as it sounds begins and ends in the trenches with the O line for the bombers for this one. Yeah, because Curtis and Brown, they're coming in with six sacks and five sacks, uh, respectively. Uh, yeah. It looks good for Stanley Bryant to be back in the lineup at left tackle. He's been practicing for the last couple of days. Uh, so that's a positive step. Um, I'm assuming Randolph is probably going to be the one coming out of there who has played well over that stretch. But yeah, that O-line, Newfeld's going to have to step it up. Um, coming back now, what, this is his second game back or third game back? Um, so either or second game back, I guess, right? Either way. Five. Yeah, like you say, that old line's got to be good. The linebackers for the Elks are good as well. Uh, Niles Morgan leading the league in in tackles with 85. And I know sometimes that stat's not the greatest because that shows that mm -hmm. hey, guys are getting through and it's a lot of tackles. But that's still pretty good, pretty good number for him. And Nick Anderson's up there as well uh, in the linebacker crew. And like we talked about, their DBs that have taken that ball away. You know, uh, yes. Dubodic Bynum. Uh, Lucius Purfoy, we know him, and Kai Gray have all been pretty good in taking that ball away. So this is going to be probably a game of the team who makes the least mistakes is going to end up winning this. But it's going to be a fun battle, especially their D-line against that O-line to see who uh, who can win those battles. Shout out to Randolph. He's been playing great. 
I'd love to see him at guard. I know Newfeld's the rock and the veteran. So you don't want to take his leadership out there. Lofton's actually starting to really turn his game around. So unfortunately for Randolph, who I think has been playing extremely well, he is alignment of the future on the Bombers. They better yeah. not lose him. They yeah, better not sure. lose him. He's so versatile. He's so athletic. And he learned their scheme very quickly. So, man, I love that kid. Let's move on to defense. <clears throat> Since the Elks put up 44 in the Rough Riders in week nine, the Elks have scored 211 points, averaging 35 points per game, uh, with them scoring 17 in their loss to Montreal. Uh, Bombers got to be careful with these dudes. This is the second best net offense in, in the league. And this is beyond garbage time and airing at the ball because they have not been playing from behind lately. Uh, they have the most touchdowns in the league with 42. The Bombers are last with 24. You know, most of that damage, yes, has been done with McLeod Bethel Thompson under center. Uh, but with that said, they have the league's best running game, averaging 117 yards per game. And they will probably lean on that three-headed running game now that they have Javon Leak, Kevin Brown, and Trey Ford. Like, shout out to Jarius Jackson, who's been calling great games and spring the ball around lately like tevin jones has been going crazy curly gittens is always dangerous and of course they have eugene lewis who's always dependable that could be the the best receiving trio in the league maybe hamilton with uh white dunbar and bridges maybe that's the other three but and now they have to worry about trey ford's legs like this is going to be a great matchup between jordan younger and jarius jackson the Bombers have to be able to get pressure on Ford and at the same time, keep him in the pocket. They can't allow aggressiveness to give Trey Ford running lanes to take the ball 15, 20 yards down the field because that's what he'll do. So yeah. that's, that's a good O-line. They have allowed the third least amount of sacks in the season. So that'll be easier said than done. And they have to show them different looks. Three-man rush, four-man rush, five-man blitz. And they have to have press coverage, I think. Press coverage until Trey Ford can find his open receiver and then switch it up. But they got to give this guy different looks, confuse him. Cause I'm not convinced he's still that elite quarterback. I think he's an elite athlete, but in regards to breaking down offenses and make those reads challenge that because he hasn't had that game time. So there's lots to do on defense. Yeah, I totally agree with pretty much everything you say. Everything I have here is pretty much the same. And you can even throw in uh, Hergie Mayala, who's been pretty good for the Elks as well in that wide receiver yes. core. Um, but like you said, it, going back to Javon Leak, guy's at 6.3 yards per carry. Kevin Brown's at five. You got to be able to contain those guys, but at the same time, contain Trey Ford. And the three-man rush that the Bombers are loving so much may become a factor in this game. And they may need to do that at first to kind of see if Ford can break it down, like you say, and find the open receivers. But at the same time, keep him in the pocket. Don't over-pursue because once you open up that lane and Ford sees it and there's no wide receivers open, he's gone. Um, and now you don't have Big Hill, your best linebacker in there. But Kyrie Wilson may be back. Uh, he's Huge. been practicing um, pretty much in full this week. So, I mean, that's usually a good sign. Well, I guess we'll find out more tomorrow for sure when the final report comes out. But that looks good. And you're definitely going to need him in this situation because the Bombers need that experience uh, on that, that linebacker crew because they're going to be tested in the run mm -hmm. game and with Ford possibly uh, taking off and running as well. Experience and the speed that Kyrie Wilson plays with. Yes. And not just speed like foot speed, but the, able to, the ability to make quick decisions in pass and rush. So... It's good to have that guy back. Holy and cow. And it's funny because we talked about Bombers O-line versus the uh, Elks D-line. It's going to be the same thing here, right? Yeah. The D-line and, the, like you say, the O-line for the Elks have not given up a lot of sacks in this winning stretch. So mm -hmm. it's going to be tough, and the Bombers haven't been generating a lot of sacks uh, against other teams in, in terms of getting to the quarterback. Maybe some pressures here and there by Willie Jefferson, but he's going to need his other guys to step up. Uh, Celestin Haba, Jake Thomas, all those guys are going to need to bring it. This is, this is going to be a tough game. It's going to be a good game. I expect it to be a very close game, uh, but it'll be a fun one to watch. How about special teams? I guess, I mean, contain Javon Leak, right? And, it, and he's been middle of the pack, so he hasn't been anything yeah. spectacular there. Um, so contain him gets, a, uh, it doesn't look good for lucky whitehead playing this game. So I don't know, uh, who's end I'm going to come in there, but they do have the best punter in the league right now. Jake Julian guys averaging 54.3, yeah. uh, compared to Sheehan who's at 44. So that's going to be huge in this game, especially if Sheehan has one of his off games. So he's going to need to go toe to toe, uh, basically with, uh, with Julian, because that field position is going to be flipped, but on the flip side, field goal wise. Boris Beatty has struggled. Castillo has been very good. So maybe there's a trade-off there, but we'll see. 
I don't think there's any way she uh, she has going to go kick for kick with Julian. No, Julian he just, just has a boomer. <laughs> Sheehan has to use his positional kicking that he learned yes. from rugby to keep Leak and whoever else on the sideline. Because the Bombers coverage unit, they're good now. Knock on wood. Don't want to jinx them, <laughs> but they've been playing really good yes, lately. So as long as he keeps that directional kicking and doesn't allow the the returner to have looks in the middle of the field, I think they'll be all right. And that's where that's where the battle will be. Not kick for kick, but in who can execute well. Like Castillo has the like longest kickoff average in the league. Yeah. So we're good there. And hopefully they can keep pinning these guys inside the 30, preferably. So Trey Ford has a bit of field to to play with, or he has a long drive Longer that he has field. to go through. Yeah, for sure. So absolutely field position. Yeah. We just we just no shanks. No shanks, Sheehan. No shanks. No, keep him in there. <laughs> keep him inside and when you're in the 20s. Between the 20s. Uh, Bomber fans, put your comments down below in regards to the Elks. Elks fans, because we know you from the Elks herd. We know you're watching. We're watching you. So put your comments down below. Don't be scared. Bold prediction for the Elks Bombers matchup. You can go first. Uh, go back to Trey Ford. Like, we're just talking about this next game, not over the two games, right? Yep. Um, yeah, I think Trey Ford will end up with more rushing yards um, than passing yards. Okay. My bold prediction is the Bombers' offense will break the 35-point mark for the third time this season. I think Trey Ford will turn over the ball. I think he'll try to run, try to make plays. There'll be fumbles to be had. Willie Jefferson, perhaps. He's going to look on his brother's side, play a game of pride, and Ty Ford will probably take the ball away. I believe he will at least once. So uh, I think that will give the opportunity for the Bombers to break the 35-point mark. And if they're committed to giving the ball to Oliveira, oh, just open it up. Yeah, Which results... Sorry, sorry, going back to this a bit too. The Bombers just released also Josh Johnson, wide receiver, right this week. So Wheatfall is coming back in. Heck yeah. Um, so we'll see. is playing too. Yeah, so we'll see if Wheatfall can pick up where he left off. You got guys coming back into form with Lawler. Uh, you know, back to play. It doesn't seem good for Wolitarski. I saw something that he was no. on the sixth game, but yeah. I, as far as I can tell, he has not practiced that a week or so. I don't know if he's gone again, which, which kind of sucks for the Bombers in, in that bad. department. So... I think I, I feel like this is going to be a close game. Like the Elks have been playing very well lately. It's in Edmonton. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be a tough one for the Bombers. It's not going to be a cakewalk or anything like that. And, and it's huge for both these teams. Bombers need to win four of the next five, and they've got the West Division wrapped up. You know, but this will this is one of those ones that they're going to have to take. And Edmonton's got almost Hamilton kind of coming up behind them. I know they got Saskatchewan and Calgary still behind them too. Or no, they're ahead of Saskatchewan still, I guess. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, my mistake. I okay. forgot that tie. <laughs> so good. there's a lot going on down there, right? And if Bombers lose, they're right now back in that thick of that race too, right? So this is a big game for for one of these teams to take. This is the craziest season I've seen in a while <laughs> yeah. in regards Every to team's disparity. In it. It's all even. It's all on the table for all these teams, pretty much. Yeah. Which results surprise you most from this week's CFL results? How badly Toronto whooped BC? I think it's more of a reflection of where the BC Lions are rather than how good Toronto is. So, like, Toronto's good. They have a good defensive line. And BC has a horrible oh, seven sacks? Are you <laughs> kidding me? I don't care what QB you have back there. Doug Flutie would have lost that game. Uh, and what are they doing? Like, what kind of decision? You know what? Chris Jones, Dave Dickinson... Now, Rick Campbell, these coaches have to stop taking the GM job. It's ridiculous. Rick Campbell left this O line pretty much as it was, nothing crazy. And look what you have now. Ugh, uh, sorry, BC, but it's not looking good. And they have a good O line coach. It's not the coach, it's, they have Kelly Bates, a great yeah. O lineman. The guy's a teacher, he knows what he's doing, but they don't have the horses and they're, they're in trouble. Well, yeah, especially after coming off two uh, impressive wins where it seemed like yeah. Rourke was kind of turning things around and becoming the old Rourke. And then you even pull him at halftime when the game's still close. It's ridiculous. Um, to add a spark, which did not work. You know, now now you created a, a mini controversy of who should, who should you start next game? Should it yeah. be Rourke or should it be Vernon Adams? You know, and, and it's needless. You know, like, why even do that at that point? If you're going with Rourke, let the guy play. You're yeah. not going to be flip-flopping back and forth because, yeah, it's... It's just going to screw you in the end, and it's just going to uh, cause problems on the team and who's in charge, right? It's a, I think it's a full-blown QB controversy oh, right yeah, now. Yeah. I guess so, yeah. Ugh. Sorry, yeah, it's, and, it, and it's something you don't need at this point in the season. You kind of got away from it by saying no, Rourke's the starter and that's it, with Vernon yeah. Adams being hurt. And then now you just brought it back into play when you didn't need to, you know? So, 
And yeah. it, I'll, I'll go with Hamilton, Ottawa. You know, and we just saw how Ottawa was impressive versus Toronto the week before and dismantling Toronto mm -hmm. and playing so well. And then, you know, Hamilton comes in and beats them and pretty handily, you know. Bo Levi Mitchell is kind of turning back the clock a little bit, putting up a Heck lot of yeah. yards, and he's looking good. He's not making the mistakes he was over the last few seasons. So he's got Hamilton right back in the mix too when we thought they were dead in the water after they had lost to the Bombers that game. So, yeah, it was a very interesting weekend altogether. The Montreal-Calgary tie too. It's like just when you think Montreal is coming back in the form, it's like how do you end up tying Calgary, who just yeah. got smoked by Edmonton twice? But it's, it's like you say, it's a crazy CFL season, man. Why can't Ottawa win on the road? I don't know. Why every time they're not home, it's like, what is this team? And then every time they're home, they're so good. Oh my yeah. goodness. Every time we start to give them praise, they kind of fall back a little, right? And they're still learning. They're still a young team. Bobby Dice is still learning. They lost a lot last year, right? So learn to win on the road. Exactly. Bro. Yeah. Now that's the next thing they got to do. Who's leading the CEFL MLP race? <laughs> I'm gonna go with a linebacker. And a, when's the last time a linebacker's won CFL MVP? Maybe yeah. never. Never, probably. Has Willie Pless ever had a chance at it? Like, it's crazy. Like, But Tyrese Beverett's having a, a great season, and he's having probably the most consistent season out of any CFLer out there. Tackles are very important to stats still. Like, give me a break, especially when you're in the middle of the defense. Uh, and he's made the most defensive plays in the CFL. Dude has five, tack uh, five tackles in regards to losses, four sacks, uh, two off the league leading sacks, uh, four forced fumbles and a pick. Like, I'll just take Tyrese Beverett. Yeah, that's it's good. It's it's wide open. Obviously, we're not going to know until the next five weeks until someone runs away with it. But like you say, it's most of the time a defensive player is not going to end up winning this unless they go crazy. And if you look at the stats or the sorry the sack department, trying to find a guy there, there's no one really running away with that either, right? I'm going to probably I think Fajardo, depending on how the season ends up, will probably end up winning this, even with not very impressive numbers. <laughs> You got Bowley by Mitchell leading the league in passing yards, but hey, he's still on a losing team, and it's a lot of throwing because you're behind a lot in some of those games. Olivera still no touchdowns at all throughout this season, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, so he could end up being in a mix. I'm going to go with Drew Brown right now, uh, who's had a fairly good season. Not great, because none of these guys have been great, but I'm going to go with him over 3,000 yards passing. Only 11 touchdowns, six interceptions. So that, to me, kind of puts me back off a little bit. Um, and then his past game against Hamilton. So, and, but I'm, I'm, I'm just going to pick Drew Brown right now. <laughs> we can have the discussion again in three weeks. Maybe it'll change and someone will have run the away with it. But... Next week, it might change. <laughs> if Bo Levi goes off for 500, he'll be in the lead for the MOP. Yeah. Plus, you got Goodness. Justin McKinnis too, man. The guy's got almost 1,200 yards receiving. And I know he's slowed down a little Last bit since games, uh, he's been almost Roar in came in. But heck yeah. Yeah. And then you got the game or something like that. Yeah, on, Milligan bro. on D as well is another guy that stepped up a little bit. So it'll be fun, fun to see. It'll be a tough one to In pick this year. Interesting. <laughs> it'll be interesting. Uh, let's move on to a little bit of um, CFL fans, Bomber fans. Put your comments in the comment section below, please. Let's do a little bit of NFL talk. Many players and football analysts have publicly advised Tua to retire. Do you agree? Um, You know what? Just... I don't, I don't have a say in him having to retire. It's, it's totally up to no him and his does. family and all that. But the way the guy has gotten hit and gone down and with his hands just every time, it that freaks me out. So, yes, I would probably tell the guy to retire as well. This conversation didn't need to happen. We talked about this. This conversation didn't need to happen after the game. Uh, and I, I don't necessarily think he, he won't retire. No, right? he said he's not. A lot of these guys will never retire just from this. But it's been scary. Like it's, I don't think he's only had three concussions, really. But it's been serious-looking concussions every time he gets hit. He looks so, like a zombie on the ground. Exactly. That's that's a scary. Like guys get concussions, but they've never, to me, have not looked the way that uh, I was about to say Zach Laros. Uh, Tua has looked uh, when he when he hits those concussions. There's far too much information and studies done on CTE and concussions to ignore it. There are far too many tragedies like Junior Seau and all these young NHL enforcers to ignore it. Like, this is a serious concern for a human being. And I, I, I disagree that they shouldn't be talking about it soon after. That's their job. That's their job, and this is a human being we're talking about. Why shouldn't we be concerned about someone's head injury moving being, forward? Sure, being concerned about the guy, but two day, or a day after, it's like, he should retire, he should retire. It's like, let the guy heal. 
Let the guy get a bit better. Let's wait a little bit before we're forcing the guy to go retire and make decisions for him. Because it's not going to happen. You're retire. You're just sharing your opinion. Wow. And I think it's fair. Like, these are three major concussions. If it was one, okay, of course, we're not gonna talk, they didn't talk about retirement then. They kind of talked, should we be thinking about retirement the second time? The second soon time, after. yeah. So I don't see the problem with the third time talking about it soon after. Like, these guys, like Antonio Pierce, they're not saying it because, oh, he's a Raiders coach and he wants Miami to lose. Like, this guy has been on the battlefield. He has seen colleagues go through CT. So I think that's well advised that he says something soon after. Like this is a brotherhood and that's concern from another brother. So I have no problem with it. And we know journalists are going to talk about it because that's their job. We ain't going to stop those motherfuckers. But good on Mike McDaniel for trying oops. Good on Mike McDaniel for trying to calm down the talk about it. I totally yes. get that. You yes. don't want the extra pressure on Tua. Right. And that's your job. But you can't ask the industry and other human beings who care about him not to talk about it. Like Yeah, it's it's fine. But I like like you say, I like McDaniel just say it's basically just chill out on this right now. You know, relax. This conversation can be had at any time. And and Miami's gone and put him on the R IR, which is a good thing. Good for them. Absolutely. Because they know obviously they're better with Tua in that lineup, right? Mm -hmm. So, but they're not going to rush it. And they know the situation. They've seen the guy and obviously they care about the guy. So they want to give it time. They want to kind of put in the background and let the guy figure things out on his own, right? It's not yeah. very often where these guys leave. Andrew Luck is one of those few guys that just said, hey man, these injuries are enough. I want to enjoy my life later on. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm going to leave. But a lot of these guys know full well once they start playing football into college, into the NFL, that they're going to get hurt, they're going to get hit, head injuries, and they just, I don't know, not that they don't care, but they're willing to deal with the risks of that and yeah. and, and down the road. But like you say, and I do agree issue. in that sense. It is, because, I mean, that's yeah, junior issue. sale, all those guys, man, it's it's tough to watch that later on in life. Yeah, and you have the money. It's not like before where those, these mega contracts are there, and that's why guys want that guaranteed money. Yeah. in case something like this happens so you have all this money on the table uh, personally i think bro i ugh. yeah that's just personally i think like that's tough man that's tough to see a guy go through that that's scary man oh yeah for sure yeah watching it on the watching it when it happened it's scary man because you don't know what's happening with the guy right and of course as a player you don't want to go like that you don't want to go out like that on your back so I get it. I get it. Uh, but you also can't tell me Mike McDaniel isn't a bit concerned about this guy's long-term health when he gives the guy a kiss on the head. Like, that's a personal friend. That's not just a player. And I'm sure he's concerned about his long-term future. But the optics, not optics, but he does have to calm down the talk with this, with this comment, which is great. Yeah, I think coaches nowadays are more friends with their players than they ever used to be, right? Absolutely. Before it was like, you play for me, you listen to me, and that's yeah. it. That's all. I'm not going to talk to you probably outside of this. I'm going to tell you what to do and we're never going to go for a beer ever kind of thing. Yeah. Right. So it's a lot different these days and the actual coaches actually seem to care about the players now than they ever did. So. And also coaches don't have that much power over the players because of these salaries as well. Are you going to tell a grown man who's making 10 times more than you what to do? Give me a break. <laughs> and put your comments in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you very much. Let's move on to some Winnipeg Jets talk. Brad Lambert has looked pretty good in the Young Stars Classic. What are your expectations and hope for him this season? We you know we talked about that Chevy quote a few weeks ago. Uh, if I'm a young player in the Jets organization today, I'm pretty excited about the opportunities that are in front of me, and I'm working pretty hard in the offseason to make sure that I take full advantage. I think that was specifically to players like Brad Lambert, more than it was to whatever his name is on another team now. And it's great hearing that Lambert is kind of taking on a leadership role and he's maturing. So I'm really optimistic with Lambert. Uh, my expectations, maybe he'll start in the top nine. I don't know, top six right away. Um, I think he'll have a tough season. I think physically he's not quite there yet. Him and Perfetti are kind of the same size. Him, a little more speed, a little more agility, which might help him a little more. Um, but I can see kind of a curve, but... I can also see a little more patience from our Neil with the younger players than we saw with bonus. So I'm pretty optimistic. I think he'll, he'll be in the club. He might stop tar he might start top nine, but I can definitely see him in top six come all-star break at least maybe even earlier. Yeah, I do agree with that. Like I'm hoping, I mean, if he can grab that second line center spot, fantastic. But we saw Perfetti grab it last year and then slowly get taken off there again. I don't know what bonus I don't know what Bonus and Perfetti's relationship was like last year, but Bonus didn't seem to trust Perfetti in a lot of situations. 
Yeah. Um, the only thing is, uh, can he snag top nine? It's got to be that center spot, though, right? Because else, who else do you have there? I know you like Gabe Velarde always to try. But Appleton? I, that, Come on. Yeah, but that's the thing. They're not going to move Appleton out of there. And then you put got on the uh, fourth line already. Yeah, but then you, where are you going to put these guys? You're not going to put Lambert on the fourth line. No, right? Put Appleton on the fourth line. Is Lambert great. a type of guy that can play on that third line with Lowry and, um, Oh, why am the I Mes- not? Uh, not Mexican, Niedermeyer. Niedermeyer, geez, how did I forget his name? Oh, I think his speed, yeah, his speed would be cool in that line. Yeah, but it, it like, you know, so, it, but we need that second line guy. We, we, I don't, you, you got Nemestikov as your second line center is not necessarily going to help you win a Stanley Cup. So you need that. somebody there. And it's either got to be Perfetti in that center spot or Lambert in that per, uh, center spot. Why right? are we giving up on Velarde? Why are we giving up on him at he center? Won't, he's not like playing center. center. He hasn't played center in a long time. It's probably going to be Velarde up there with Connor and Shifley, unless somehow Ehlers, who is another situation altogether here, uh, gets a spot. So the, the interesting like, training camp starts tomorrow. So you got no Cole Perfetti signed yet. That's still not happening. Um, we also got Nikita Chabrikov, who, who looked good in this Young Stars tournament too, who may actually look good on that third line better because he's a bit of a pest. Um, you know, he never stopped skating. He can score as well kind of thing. So he might look good on there for a bit. But again, these guys are 19 and 20, right? So long uh, rigors of a NHL season, they still don't know how that's going to go yet. So they may be up and down uh, throughout the season, uh, like in press box, in the lineup kind of thing. So it'll be interesting, but I hope Lambert can stick in like top six, top nine for sure, hopefully. Uh, but they'll definitely need these young guys to step up because there's holes in this lineup and there's opportunities in this lineup. Yes. But, you know, can these guys grab them? You know, and it'll be a training camp will be interesting. The exhibition games will be interesting as well to see how these guys step up. Yes, you can play very well uh, against other guys who are your your age, your size in the Young Stars tournament. And even, uh, Ch- 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 oh, I keep saying his name, Lock, Chabrikov, mm-hmm, who Chibikov. looked good against these younger guys and being a bit of a pass, getting into fights. How's he going to look against older, more seasoned NHL players uh, who know how to deal with these type of guys? So that's going to be uh, going to be interesting. I'm excited for training camp starting. Yeah, no, discounting Velarde at center is ridiculous. Not that he's especially discounted, they just don't lose, play him. Especially after it. you lose uh, Monaghan. Like, come on, just to give it to, to, to give it to Nemesnikov? No. Lambert's not going to be ready to start at 2C, and neither will Perfetti, who's not even there. So I don't even think Velarde's in the mix for it or has in play should be. center. So he has I don't played think center. He's I very he, comfortable at center. He's said since, that himself. Since he's been in Winnipeg, and even with Los Angeles, his last spot was on the wing. So I don't think he's been playing center for uh, a, a good deal of time or amount of time. So That don't make no difference to me. I think he should be considered. Well, I haven't seen any lineup with him there yet, so I don't think that's going to happen. I don't care. I think he should be considered. <laughs> I don't care. It's ridiculous. This guy can play the center. He can play physically. He can play on the boards. Like, can he stay no healthy? No sense though. that he's not considered. Can he stay healthy? That's a big question mark for him. Well, that's going to be season. a question if he can play wing as well. <laughs> it's going to be a question if he can play wing as well if he's going to get injured. Him and his back. Well, I know. Yeah, that's the thing. Because I mean, uh, if you look at it, it's depth-wise. I mean, it's a lot of younger guys, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you, you need him to stay healthy, hopefully. And I know there's going to be injuries. It's the NHL season, man. People get injured. So Training camp starts in a couple days. Tomorrow, first yes. exhibition Will game the is Jets uh, record- Saturday. Will the Jets' record be better or worse than last season? I'm going to go with worse. Um, and hopefully they're at least battling for a wild card spot because the Central Division to me has gotten better. Nashville with Stamkos yes. and all their signings have gotten better. Uh, Chicago is going to be a year older, so they'll probably be a little, uh, tougher than they were last year. Um, and there's just right now, that, like we just talked about, there's holes on this Jets lineup. And until we can see what these guys can do, um, there's holes on the defensive pairing. Who's going to be that third pair? Is it going to be Colin Miller, Stanley Hainala? Um, you also had uh, Elias uh, Salamonson, who's coming in from um, playing in Sweden, I believe, right? Uh, in the men's league there. Um, so after DeMello and Pionk on the right-hand side, there's there's a big hole there, right? So we'll see what he can do and if he can take a spot. But you can't play Hellebuck. The backups are a bit of a question, too. You can't play Hellebuck every game. So he's going to need to be steady and good and win his games, and hopefully the backups can steal a game or two here and there. But I, at the first, the start of the season, I believe, will be rough. And there may be more losses than wins till these guys start to figure out. Then they'll get hopefully rolling a bit and, and play some competitive hockey. 
I think the record will be worse, but I think they'll have a better team come the end of the season. They'll be really leaning on Haley for those first 20 games to figure out who they are as a team. Yeah. Everyone says it takes 20 games to figure out. They will take the full <laughs> 20. Edmonton yeah. will know who they are come game five. Winnipeg, it'll take that full 20 to figure out who these lines are, who will be effective, and maybe even beyond that. But record-wise, it'll be worse. Wild card, maybe third in the central. Yeah, Top three centers of all. Oh, sorry, hold on one second, because you got questions what? too with Neil Pionk. Uh, bad season last year. Can he bounce back? Because otherwise, you only really got three D that are kind of decent, and then there's question marks in the next uh, four to six spots, right? That's so, one. That's not going to make him any better to be better than third or fourth in the central. I don't think. No, no, I don't. Neil think Pionk can have a season of his life. I still don't think they're going to be better than third or fourth in the central. No, I don't think so either. That's why I'm thinking probably wild card spot here at the end of it all. But I agree with you on the 20 games thing. And there's going to be a lot of overreactions, uh, you know, to the Jets. If, you know, if they lose to start off, people are going to be losing their minds. But I think it's going to be patience to start this season for sure for the Jets. Let's go on some uh, all-time Jets question. The top three centers all-time on the Jets. I'm going to go te- Kent Nelson, Dale Howarchuk, and Alf Nelson. Kent Nelson only because, not only because, he had great two great seasons with the WHA Jets, and I double-dipped in the WHA Jets. When Wayne Gretzky says, skill-wise, he might have been the most skilled hockey player I ever saw in my entire career, if Wayne Gretzky says that, I'm going to take him on the team. Dale Howarchuk, my favorite player of all time. Dude has a statue outside the arena. Easy. Alf Nelson. Four seasons, 120, 114, 124, 126 with Avco Cup. So, Nielsen, Nielsen, and Howard Chuck, top three centers for me. Well, I agree with you, but I stuck to the NHL, not the WHA. So, mine are pretty much, I mean, you got Dale Howard Chuck, obviously best center of all time on the Jets, fit, most favorite player kind of thing. And if he had stuck around, you know, the whole career with the Jets, you know, his, his point totals would have been way above everybody else's kind of thing. Cool. Uh, but the the funny thing is when you look through the Jets and their uh, centers throughout the lifetime of the Jets, uh, it doesn't get very impressive. Like Thomas Steen, you know, I have him in there because I just stuck with the NHL. Uh, good center, nothing flashy, put up the points, played a lot of games for the Jets, but was never the type of guy that was going to go crazy some games and and lead a line or, or sorry, not lead a line or lead a, t- a team to victory kind of thing. But he was very steady. Uh, the last one I'm going to go with, and he's still playing right now because there's not a lot of options. I was going to went with Mark Shifley, uh, who right now sits at 717 points uh, in just under 800 games. Uh, so he's going to have another five, six seasons probably with the Jets, um, and we'll see where he ends up in, ter- in terms of everything like that. But I stuck with the NHL. I agree with your picks. I probably picked them over the guys I ended up picking, but that's the way it goes. How are you going to disrespect the dub like that? Because I thought we were just sticking to the NHL. You said Jet centers of all time. I did. I, I did. I did. I was just thinking NHL. Shoot. I'll give love oh, to. Well. They got they got banners <laughs> in the building. They belong to be. They deserve to be mentioned. But I agree with oh, you, they you do. too. They Shifley, do. They do, Shifley yes. was the one with uh, with Kent Nilsson. But that Gretzky quote put me over the edge. Yeah. One of the most skilled players, and he had a great career with the Calgary Flames too. Won a yeah. cup with them. Exactly. Yeah. With the Jets team, so he came back in the Smite Division and was a terror. <laughs> oh. Winnipeg Jets fans. Oh, this is going to be painful again. The Jets have never won a cup. The Avco Cup. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we can't even say that cup in the same name as <laughs> Winnipeg Jets fans. Put your. We weren't even born there. So. Oh, my goodness. Who are your three favorite Winnipeg Jets centers of all time? How do you think the Jets will do? And also, what up with Brad Lambert? Benny, what do you got to say to our friends? Yeah, just thanks a lot for listening. Uh, Don't forget, subscribe, follow, and uh, have a good week. Yeah, yeah. Dad podcast? I don't know. We'll see if it works. (laughs) We're trying something new with a sponsor and some ads and technology. Oh, my goodness. I'm still in Calgary. So in the words of Ed Whalen, in the meantime and in between time, that's it. Another edition of Ray and Benny Talk Sports. Hey, friends and neighbors. Don't forget to check us out online on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at Ray Denny Sports. And don't forget to check out our YouTube channel. Leave a like, leave a comment, tell us what you think.